This morning, I want to talk a little bit about expectation versus reality, right? And first, we start with great expectation and great expectation talking about who this Jesus was supposed to be, what he was supposed to do, what he was supposed to be like. And some might say that he was a grassroots level kind of rebel who was, who has come to to shake things up just a little bit. Other people would say he had royal bloodlines traced all the way back to the king of kings, King David himself. Other people would say that he had come to to lift up the nation of Israel and restore it back to like God level favoring. Other people said he was a he was somebody who would come and rescue them from the oppression of Rome. Who was Jesus? We have all kinds of different assumptions as to who Jesus is and what he would do. And the last thing that anybody expected, the last thing that anybody expected was Good Friday. So the crucifixion surprised everybody who followed Jesus. It brought an end to all of their great expectations of who he was and what he would do. And now he was dead. Now, even though this was a surprise, even though Jesus over and over and over again would tell his people that were listening, the Son of Man must suffer and die. But people forget that. I think people back in that day, as well as people in our day today, we tend to believe what we really want to believe, not just what God tells us, but what feels right in that moment. Well, what expectations do we have with God and with Jesus? Maybe some of these expectations sound familiar to you, that if you, if you work really hard and you're, you're a good person, then God will bless you, right? In fact, the better you are, the more blessed of a life you'll have. Maybe the mistakes that you've made, Those bad things that happen in your life happen because God is punishing you for doing wrong. In fact, God blesses the good and he punishes the bad. Except what happens when bad things happen to those who do good things. Or maybe those who do whatever in the world they want to do, live however they want, seem to be blessed. What about... What about when, when life just goes sideways and the, the, the way that you think things should be and the way things should go are not the way they go? When God's will is to do something that makes no sense whatsoever or you're pleading for God to stop something that's evil and it just persists and continues. Sometimes our expectations of God come crashing into the cross, and they don't make sense. These expectations that we have can come face to face with a harsh reality. Now, I don't want to bring the mood down at all, but I do want to take us into the text, into Mark's gospel, talking about this resurrection morning, and into the life of Mary and Mary and Salome, and their life in this moment is dark, right? They've got this this harsh reality of life that all that they had hoped and dreamed about who Jesus would be has come crashing down around them, and they woke up to a nightmare. You can even see, if you imagine their faces, they're crestfallen, they're broken. You can still see the, the marks of the tears running down their cheeks, the puffiness from their eyes from not getting very good sleep the night before. And that's their harsh reality that they wake up to this morning. And they were saying to one another, who will roll the stone away for us from the entrance of the tomb? And then looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back and it was very large. And now the the fogginess of their their sleepless night now, now comes into sharp focus as they realize Number one, they forgot about the stone. And number two, the stone is already rolled away. Now, it says that they were 
they, they looked up and saw that the stone was rolled away, which implies that before they looked up, they were looking down. And if you've ever walked an, an unknown trail in the early morning before the light really gets bright, you spend a lot of time looking down because you want to make sure that you're not going to trip over rocks or holes or whatever might be in your path. So you're looking down to focus on the problems. And that's the problem. Because when you spend your life looking and focusing on all the problems, you don't have the time to look up and see the solution God has ready for you. And this is where the women were that day. And then entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on their right side, dressed in white, and they were alarmed. Now, this man in white was alarming. He was an angel of God. And angels throughout the New Testament always freak people out. Right? Anytime the full glory of heaven radiates out and shines out on fallen, broken humanity, fallen, broken humanity loses it. And they lose it. And so he has to say, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid. So they went looking for a corpse. And they find an angel. But what about the harsh realities of our own lives? Have you ever had one of those nightmares that was so intensely real that when you wake up, you're still kind of afraid that it might be real? And then slowly, you realize with relief, that was just a dream. There's been a handful of times in my life that I can remember an absolutely horrific day that God enabled me to walk through. And then I went to bed that night, sleepless, and I woke up praying that that was a nightmare. But the nightmare didn't fade because it wasn't a dream. It was real, and that very real horror was still right in front of me and not going away. That's how these women felt that day. That heaviness, that harsh reality staring them in the face. Now, when you wake up to a nightmare like this, there's many different ways that you can respond. Sometimes you respond in fear or, or anger or doubt. And, and these are all examples of a, of a heart that's not fully awakened by the power of life in Christ. And it's a normal reaction when life is difficult without faith. Sometimes it's like the rest of Jerusalem that day, right? Mary, Mary, and Salome, they get up early and they go to the tomb. The rest of Israel is sleeping, still in bed. And sometimes when you wake up to a, a, a horrible reality, it's, just, it's tempting just to grab the cover and just go right back under the bed and just hang out there and not face the truth. I want to let you know something. Sometimes it feels like God doesn't live up to our expectations of Him. Right? And there, there's people in this room, lots of people in this room, and there's lots of people in this room who have had life not turn out the way they thought it would. Now, there's lots of comfortable people. Praise God. And sometimes that can be its own challenge to relying on God when you don't need to. But for those who have just encountered those incredibly dark days, incredible intense pain, it's easy just to wonder, God, where are you in all of this? Why aren't you, why aren't you making this better? And sometimes we hold God to our standard as to who he is and what he's supposed to do with the brokenness of this world. But I want you to know this. We are not to hold God to our standard. God wants to lift us up to see his standard. And God always consistently exceeds our expectations. Now, you might be sitting here and say, yeah, but you don't know my life. You don't know what I've walked through. Maybe not. And we all have our own journey. But I can promise you this, because I see it in Scripture and I see it in my life, that the worst days of my life God has used to bless me and bless other people. And I am firmly convinced that that's exactly how he works through all of our struggles, all of our difficulties, all of our dark mornings. He will use 
the worst things done to you, He will use the worst things you have done to others and weave them into His will in a masterful way like only the artist He is can do and make it beautiful in the end. I can't tell you exactly how. I just know that it's true. If you are in a dark morning, hang on, keep taking steps forward and see the empty tomb today and see what God has for you. You might be surprised. Now, he said to them, the angel said to Mary, Mary, and Salome, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is not risen. He is not here. See the place. He is risen. I said he is not risen. Okay, thanks. He is risen. He is not here. Those are important things to get right. Whew. Very specific. Jesus, there's lots of Jesuses, right? In our minds, there's one Jesus. That was a common name. But he says, Jesus of Nazareth. That narrows it down. This is precise. And this is his tomb. They walk in. If you walk in looking for somebody, they're not there. You're like, I must have the wrong space. He's like, no, this is the right one. But he is not here. He is risen. This word risen is like it gets up. He physically gets up and gets out. You know, there's this, this time where Jesus comes across this man who is invalid. He can't walk. And Jesus says to this man, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And he does. I can hear the Father say to Jesus, laying in the tomb, breathe, stand up, and live. And he does. And the stone is rolled away not to let Jesus out. Jesus doesn't need an exit to get out of the tomb. He gets out of the tomb. The stone is rolled away so that we can see into it and know that he is not there. But go and tell his disciples, and also Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Go and tell. Which sounds a whole lot like the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, right? Except this isn't to all nations. This message is special. This message is for those who believe, who have followed Jesus in the past, and who will follow him again. Go and tell them. Go tell the disciples. And also Peter. Why is it saying also Peter? Because if we go back to the day when Peter denied Jesus three times and the rooster crows, Jesus looks at Peter and Peter's heart drops. And he's been overcome with guilt and shame ever since, and very much feeling like he's on the outside looking in. Because certainly his mistake, his, his denial of Jesus is unforgivable. But Jesus isn't done with Peter yet. Go tell the disciples, even Peter. Because Jesus has a plan to restore Peter, to, to, to bless Peter, to have Peter have this opportunity to confess and be filled with the grace of Jesus, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to be filled with a mission and a purpose in the church. Now, this morning, there are several people in here that I see on a regular basis. You are the disciples. You are here. But for those of you who are the and Peters in the room, I'm talking to you right now. Jesus is glad that you're here today. He has such an intense love for you. You are the reason he went to the cross. And I say that not to make you feel judged or guilty, but to know that the grace that he earned for you there, he generously, desperately wants you to have it. He loves you. He's forgiven you. He knows where you've been and what you've done, and he still loves you. Not only does he love you, not only does he want to include you back into the in crowd again, he has a plan for you. He has a role for you. He has a mission and a purpose for you. 
before the world knows, the disciples and you. And now you are a disciple. See, God exceeds our expectations with his grace. He forgives people who, who have a hard time forgiving themselves. And it is his joy. Scripture says it was a joy for him to endure the cross because of you. Because he knew that by enduring the cross, he was pulling you back into the Father's family. And to give you life. Not a consolation prize but a resurrected life made new. God always exceeds our expectations, even if we can't see it right away, even if it takes a long time to wait to see it happen. I can promise you this. God will each and every time be 100% faithful to exceed your expectations. Give him time. And his timing is perfect. And then Mark does something funny. He ends his gospel unlike the other three gospel writers. Right? He ends his gospel before everybody has a chance to see Jesus. Right? He ends this gospel. The, the angel says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. And they leave, but they don't tell anybody because they're scared to death. And they're silent and they're frightened. Now, it's important to know a little bit about who Peter, or excuse me, who Mark, the writer of this gospel, who Mark is writing this gospel to, his very first hearers. And Mark's very first hearers were about 30 years after the resurrection, about 60 A.D. And he's writing to Christians who are in Rome. And the climate in Rome, if you were a Christian, was horrible. Nero was emperor, and he hated Christians. He blamed them for fires that ransacked and destroyed most of Rome. And he blames the, the Christians, and he, and he starts to persecute the church in massive ways. In fact, if you were Christian and you confessed Jesus as Lord, you would die. And Mark is writing this gospel to a people who are scared to death. As if to say, I know, I know where your heart is. I know you're frightened. I know you're scared. We were too. We were too. I mean, the disciples, they all hid in a locked door, in a locked room, for fear of what was going to happen to them. And it wasn't, and, and Mark goes on and on and on throughout his gospel of miracles and signs that Jesus did. And even this greatest miracle and sign, the resurrection, that wasn't enough to produce faith in people's lives. Because signs and wonders are just signs and wonders. People come to faith because they hear his word and they have an interaction with the resurrected Lord. We know from the other gospels that Mary and Mary and Salome, that Peter and John, that the other disciples, even Thomas, all of them came to believe because Jesus showed up face to face. The power of the resurrection is not the empty tomb. It's the Savior who could not be contained by it. And when he engages with your life, when he intersects into your problems, when he comes in to intervene in your brokenness and he brings you life, it changes who you are. You can't stay the same. This is my prayer for you. Whether you're a disciple or whether you're an and Peter. I didn't mean to go, you guys are disciples, you guys are and Peters. Sorry about that. You're intermixed. <laughs> this is Jesus' heart for you this Easter. It's not that you come and you see the tomb is empty, but you come and see Jesus. To know him, to know his love for you, to know his sacrifice for you, to know that he would die for you, to know that he rose for you, to know that he will help you one day rise as well that there is no death and there is no tomb that is strong enough to hang on to our Lord and Savior. And there is no death and no tomb that is strong enough to hold you either. Let Jesus come to you face to face this year. Maybe it's through another conversation with another believer. Go and tell somebody. 
Share the good news, even with, a, even with a believer. We need to hear it. We need encouragement. We need strength. Go and tell. And let him change your life forever. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, words cannot express the gratitude that we have for what you have done for us in Christ. And we all come to you with different types of expectations about who you are and what you should do and when you should do it and and how you should do it. But Father, show us your will. Your incredible sovereignty to use even the brokenness and the darkness in our life to produce beautiful things. Engage with us. Let us see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.